<laughs> yes, we are we are live. You're live? Oh no. <laughs> what? We started sending to Ali. I'm it says broadcasting live, so all right, so you should see something. It should say stick diagram concept issues. All right, good deal. All right, so that is an actual physical layout of an XOR gate. This is more complicated than what you're uh, going to typically uh, see at the beginning, like what we're doing right now or what I would ask about on an exam. Uh, so what's going on here is you're going to, you're basically creating flow from VDD or ground. And I, the way I presented it, I had the, the, the P diffusion region, P plus and N minus diffusion regions are represented by these, uh, the lines and the dots are respectively. And so you have contacts that are represented by metal. And we'll go into a lot more detail uh, later as to what precisely is going on here. But you have flow from VDD and ground. Now, if you look at the third green box uh, in the P uh, diffusion regions. I'm going to, you'll see it in a few seconds that I have boxed out here. Every, the general concept issue is that people think that the flow must go from left to right. That's not the case because physically it's just you're creating flow from source to drain. So the source is what you represent the source as and the drain is what you represent the drain as. So it should, in this case, goes from right to left to the output when this poly and this poly are activated and have zeros. And likewise, on all the rest of them, it's basically, it is left to right. But uh, we have an, I came up with a, an example question here. So we have the uh, path diagrams for it. It's negated by of A and B or D or C, D or D, E, which we use some basic logic reduction to get to D and C or E. So I have two solutions for the stick diagram. So I'm going to put those up. And in this case, a lot of the questions I was getting about what order do you put the polys in? So do you, so in this case, we have A, B, C, D, and E. And you use the path diagrams as kind of your guide. When you start seeing them come together, you want to make sure they're together. So this is two potential solutions to this problem. In one case, I have C and E together right next to A and B. And in the other case, I have mm -hmm. D and then C and E. And so basically, there's always going to be more than one solution to this type of thing. So in this case, the, the pull-up network is A or B. So it's going to be A and B. So you have to, you're going to go through A or you go through B to get to the pin. Now, I have included on this diagram S and D, which I'm, you're, not going to, you're not required to have for your actual uh, exam solution, but I want to indicate if you're going from VDD through A, you notice how the source is on the right and the drain is on the left. You are you are permitted to do that. So this goes from the source, it circumvents the transistor B and gets to this contact, at which point it can either go through C and then E to get to the output or circumvents C and E and gets to D. In the pull-down network, it has to go through source drain, source drain of both A and B goes to the output, and then here it starts on the right for the D transistor first, and then it either goes through, it has to go through C or through E, right? And all the bottom line right that's clear for me is if, if you look between the B and the C transistor, notice how I have, there's two contacts there. No, no. The reason why that's permitted, if we go back up and to our original uh, diagram that I showed you, that XOR 
Okay. Notice how they're separating the context physically. Yeah. So when, when I, if you're going to see me scroll back up here, so the contacts are actually physically separated, but they're within the P diffusion region. That's it. What you're, that is what you represent physically there. So you are permitted to do that. And, and you notice how I kind of did a little erasing. The, the whole point of the stick diagram is to actually kind of give you a general layout of what you want to do before you actually go in and do the physical design. And I can tell you from experience, doing these stick diagrams when you're building your cells saves you hours, sometimes even days of work. <laughs> so in the top one, so I have them both uh, separated here because basically you're actually separating the D transistor uh, from the B transistor, just like you were doing physically before. Does that uh, answer the, there are a number of concept questions. I think those are the two general. So you're, so when you have the question on the exam, uh, it's going to be a question that can have multiple answers like this, but you ultimately want to, when you're going through, my recommendation when you're checking your work, because it's going to be a take-home exam, so you're going to have the opportunity to check your work and everything. When you're going through, put your, uh, your uh, path diagram and your stick diagram next to each other and actually check to see if the flow... Like, so, for example, I had uh, the first part is you have VDD and it has to go through A or B, right, to get to the midpoint from the path diagram. So you should check it and say, all right, so I know I have to have a contact here. And so it's either going to flow through A or it can flow through B. And the goal gets here and it gets to that contact. So my recommendation is have those next to each other and check them. Like I would act like when I did take home exams when I was an undergrad and grad student, I would actually make a little note. It's like my checking of my work is in a green pen. I recommend using green pen because I'm going to grade it in red. So that way you can differentiate between uh, my work and yours. But actually, if you're going through and demonstrating like, okay, I've done the work and now I've actually checked it and made sure they all match up, that not only makes, you know, happy grade or equals, you know, higher grades, right? Uh, but also it's a good idea just to, for discipline. So that way when you're doing work in industry, you're actually developing the habit of checking everything before you put it into the code. And try, that'll save you tons of time in, uh, at, at your work. So uh, hopefully I'm giving you advice that makes your professional career easier. All right. So um, give you a split second for the lag to catch up. The stick diagram stuff. So, uh, the other big thing we want to do is be able to take these physical layouts and be able to represent them using code. So when you're that, you know, we had, we had you know, basically 10 transistors there. So now we're getting into a uh, MSI level circuit. So what happens when we're starting to get millions and millions of transistors on a chip? And starting to get to that point, we're starting to get to represent many processors or application-specific chips. You want to start using hardware description like. So for those of you who already survived 385 and 386, which should be all of you, um, you've already done some VHDL, right? So VHDL was uh, come up; it was developed by the military. So of course, it's with an acronym of an acronym, an acronym very high speed and very circuit. This was VHSIC, Hardware Description Language HDL. In this course, we're going to cover uh, another one, and more. It was originally proprietary. That was. Uh, could be owned by the company that eventually became Keyes, which you're going to be very familiar with their tools by the end of the semester. Um, we call it Verilog. And Verilog is a little different. It's kind of based to work to be similar to C. They want, they want that same kind of coding paradigm within C and within uh, Verilog. So a lot of the Verilog in this course, uh, there's going to be a website where I want you to go on and self-teach, take the quizzes, and then you submit the quizzes to me, and that's your proof that you just basically take screen captures of the of the results. Um, so there's three different levels, behavioral modeling, structural modeling, and physical modeling. Uh, the behavioral modeling, uh, we formally define as an explicit definition of mathematical relationships between the input and output with no implementation information. So that's, we start out, if we're doing stick diagram, that's, you know, your F equals AB naught, right? So 
Verilog gives you plenty of opportunities to do behavioral modeling. You know, VHD, of course, does that as well. Now, one of the problems with behavioral modeling is that you're dependent upon the physical implement underlying implementation of your code. If you recall, for those of you who had me for 385, I was very adamant that you should know the difference between uh, computer architecture and computer organization, right? So computer architecture with system attributes of a computer, which contribute to its logical execution and are visible to the programmer. So the reason why that's important is because when you're actually physically designing a computer chip as an electrical engineer, you have to worry about power consumption, you have to worry about area, and you were gonna be worrying about, we're talking about PVT pressure, uh, uh, you know, uh, voltage and temperature issues, right? So when you don't know what's going on, you can get a lot of bloat if you don't worry about area minimization. And when you're dependent upon that, that's when you did behavioral modeling. Structural modeling is you have an implicit definition of IO relationships through a particular structure using interconnection of components. So these are physical details of the computer that are transparent to the programmer. So structural modeling has a lot to do with computer organization. And then physical modeling, you've done some basic physical modeling with your stick diagrams. Deals with how the system is laid out in the physical space. So the next thing we're going to cover, uh, for those of you who had, had me before, you'll recognize this, the Skansky and uh, Khan chart. Uh, basically, it's a whole layout of the description between behavioral, structural, and physical modeling. Uh, in this diagram, they refer to physical modeling as geometric modeling. And if you think back to that uh, diagram I showed at the beginning of class at as the uh, XOR gate, you have basically blocks and squares and polygons and you're using lambda rules. So that's geometry. But you're using the lambda rules of the geometry to actually tell us describe physical rules that can guarantee appropriate uh, implementation of the device. So in structural, you know, processor memory switches and you know, register transfer, RTL languages, gates and transistors. Functional, you dealt with algorithms, so you know sign multiplication algorithm. Uh, you'll learn about an algorithm called D algorithm in this course. Uh, register transfer language. How do you actually describe this? Boolean equations and differential equations. So differential equations, as you, from, you've learned from 351, uh, dictate the relationship between capacitance, inductance, and resistance. And that we're, we'll be going into that and how do these actual you know, quantum equations tie into the physical implementation. What's, What's so funny? It's okay. Technology. <laughs> this is just where I launched into the back in my day. We didn't have the internet, and you basically just, yeah. Yeah, back in my day. If you miss class, you're just permanently stupid, you know? <laughs> So, uh, and then polygon sticks, you're, you've learned about sticks, standard cells. Uh, standard cells, we're taking these stick diagrams. You want to have, have these highly sized you know, diagrams. We're just showing them that X over K can be handy, inverter, and be able to put them together so that we can actually you know, have a near actually coding in the RTL language and have some actual numbers and numbers that we can actually have this physically represented. So, you also, we're also going to be learning about a language called Spice where you're actually tying. Trans transistors together. Um, in, you can actually, there's actually, in Verilog, there are actually PMOS, NMOS, CMOS, transmission gate uh, logic that you can actually put in and code in to actually physically represent your device. So, so does anybody have any questions on this? Slightly off topic. Sure. We're doing the VHDL project thing for 35. When you write a compiler or whatever, you pull up like, you know, like I said, this weird diagram full of colors and mods. That, that kind of like, it doesn't show the architecture of the processor and how it's mapped. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the floor plan, which we'll go to get in towards the end of the class. So 
in grade five and grade six, you want to be able to lay it out on your on your board. And so basically, that shows you what parts of the board are going to be used. The lookup tables, the various navigation like switches. Uh, in this course, you're going to be actually laying it out on a chip. And so the, the floor plan is you want to optimize the area and make sure you can have optimal flow uh, to, you know, for appropriate timing without having too much uh, power consumption. If you, want to, you want the power consumption to spread out so that way uh, it doesn't burn up parts of the, of the chip faster. Um, and if you put everything on one portion of the chip, instead of spreading it out appropriately, you can, it causes a real problem. Um, so that's where the floor plan is. We're going to do a lot of floor planning and take out towards the end of the course, especially as you start working on the. You, you, the whole goal is you're actually going to be doing a set of labs, and by the end of the labs, you're actually going to have, be able to send that chip off to chip design off to Mosses, and they could actually send it back, and you can have your own CMOS chip that you've made. But that, I, I, I went off topic on your off topic question, but they all tie in together. So um, this is where I get to brag a little bit. Uh, the, this uh, hardware description language, the first one is called ISP. It's invented by C. Gordon Bell, who's now the uh, head of research at Microsoft. And when your buffering is done, you get to see a photo of me with him at the Turing Awards in 2012. Um, so I've met him and had dinner with him, and he's very nice. And OK, so. Um, the general, okay, so basically this, what I have written up here is a, a uh, review of some of the things I've kind of hit on, where they're talking about custom design, design versus uh, synthesized design of computer chips. So custom design, you actually are going to go in and you're actually going to analyze every portion of the chip. So we, we're working on those different levels in the gas key can uh, con chart, right? And you worry about either the structural behavioral model or you're actually dealing with the geometry or dealing with the sticks and you're dealing with polygons and you're dealing with um, the actual physical layout. So our synthesized design, you're using an HDL tool which will try to synthesize it down as much as possible. Uh, obviously, when you're dealing with millions and millions of transistors, you want to represent have cells represent either gates or specific logic functions for you to be able to optimize your design. So that's where a synthesized design comes in, as opposed to actually custom making each portion of the chip. And as I, I basically allude to, when you think about uh, when you're doing millions of transistors on a chip, synthesized design is obviously what you prefer because it takes significantly less time, especially when you have uh, in trying to have everything flow out. So um, I wanted to sh just show you, this is an actual job description that's currently on Intel's website right now, kind of give you an idea of what we're going to be covering over the rest of the course. Um, at, on week 10, the second day after you do your presentations for SemiWiki, I have posted a sample resume that Intel uh, gave me. Uh, I, I, their, uh, their military outreach uh, gave it to me because I'm a military veteran. And uh, I used this and actually got a job offer from Intel. So, you know, it's an industry approved resume sample, and this is what the type of things that they're going to be looking for. So, you're going to want to, uh, we're actually going to have, I'm going to have you guys bring up your resume on your laptops, and we're going to work through them and try to say, hey, let's, let's make you guys look like badasses. So that way you get really good jobs, right? Right? George is laughing because he's been through that process with me, but uh, so is Demba. So is Demba. And, you know, you, resumes were a lot better, right? Yeah. That's because it's your resume is now representing how uh, your quality work. It's what you want, right? You don't want it. In engineers, we have a tendency to want to sell ourselves short just because you don't want to be arrogant or cocky or whatever. But uh, there's proper ways to do it, and this is what I want to point out. So, you know, the person who is going to be deciding whether or not you get an interview is not qualified for your job, more than likely. It's somebody in human resources. It's somebody who's you know, they have certain things that they have to check and they're not going to know the difference between, you know, if you put certain, you know, certain words that are equivalent. So if you have a specific job, you only want to modify your resume to make sure that you're actually hitting the check marks that they're looking for. So, you know, custom foundry, the, the whole idea is that we're at, you know, that's where you're actually designing a computer chip and putting it together. So, and you saw the foundry process in that video I showed last week. Um, 
highly motivated, ASIC physical design, application specific integrated chip implementation and verification, CAD flow design automation. Uh, so in that resume, you want to indicate that you've done work with ASICs because you will have done that by the time you're done with this class. Um, minimum requirements, bachelor in electrical or computer engineering or related discipline. Uh, any combination of the following experiences. So you want to hit as many of these as possible. So, and you see they've even included obtained through academic coursework, projects, research, or relevant job internship. So oftentimes when I see students you know, come to me with their resumes, they, you've done all of these projects. Like you've survived my class and Dr. Goggins' class or maybe Dr. Daigle's class. And you've done all of these projects where you know, you demonstrated that you have knowledge in your head and you can actually implement it. Right? But people don't include them. But that's the best way to catch up on this idea of you, you don't you don't have experience. Yes, you do. You'd have to do all that you know VHDL project for 385, right? It's a lot of that was a lot of work. Take credit for it. You've got it done. So here, RTL, you're gonna be learning about RTL coding, digital design, computer architecture, VLSI synthesis. Uh, gate level simulations, you've done that already. Static timing constraints analysis, functional verification. Uh, for ASIC implementation, digital design, VLSI CMOS synthesis, advanced place and route, place and route clocking tree synthesis, we'll learn that later in this course. Uh, VLSI CAD tools, you'll, you'll work with a lot of, so you'll write the specific tools that you used in this course. Um, ASIC verification, digital design, static timing analysis, formal verification. Um, layout versus schematic and design rule check. So I, I have these down here. You probably you're not familiar with these yet, but um, you have your layout versus schematic performance verification. Uh, layout versus schematic. Correlate those two. So that's an LVS problem. Uh, synthesis performance verification. Boundary scanning. We'll be going that into that in section six. Automatic test pattern generation. You'll be familiar with the D algorithm. Um, and then tape out is the final result of the design cycle for integrated circuits. So by doing this course, you'd be very qualified for a pretty high paying Intel job. So, but we'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go over uh, how to tie that into, I, I, we're not going to go into the joint test action group uh, in this course. I do want to introduce a testing course eventually uh, later on. So does anybody have any questions before I move on to kind of what Verilog is? Any questions about industry and look, looking for work in terms of just looking at a resume and how that ties into this course? How similar is Verilog to C actually? Very. And it's almost like you're... Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it, they, this, they have it has the same kind of similar preprocessors instead of functions, they're called modules. So, very similar. So, um, 385, you learned VHDL. We learned Verilog and Spice in this course. Uh, Verilog stands for Verifying Logic. So, it's very different than the acronym within the acronym. Um, they wanted to use a language that was similar to C, and they used a, a similar concept of preprocessors. So, Remember, pound include and you have to include libraries for those of you who coded in C. Those are the preprocessors. So you, when you do a uh, Verilog, you're going to see a lot of that. Um, now, this diagram that will show up in 15 seconds is the idea of the design hierarchy. So it's going to have a system and it have a set of modules underneath. Let's yes, Thomas. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I permitted you to come in and listen. So. You can go to this, let me go to this verilog.com here. And so this is where you're able to go and see a number of different uh, samples of Verilog. Uh, Verilog is an IEEE standard. Um, I guess that's all the data. And so this is a basic example of Verilog. So DOM.V. So it has labels A, B, and C. Oh, well, let me let it come up in a second, I'll go over everything. But the general idea is that you're gonna initialize with inputs and outputs, and then you're gonna have registers hold certain values. So this is just module foo. 
and it has out it has one output logic A and everything else to it is inputs. So B is a 32-bit input, uh, C is an 8-bit input, and the select line is a 4-bit input, and you have an input clock signal. So if you're comparing it to the a computer architecture that we worked on before, you can think of A, I'm sorry, input B as your one of your 32-bit inputs. Uh, if you recall, you had an 8-bit select line uh, that had for control signals in the MIPS data path. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, C, control signal, and then select line. If you have four, let's see how many of you actually remember this. Oh, no, it's, it's a con uh, controllers. Yeah, because you're going to have you know, you know, register write, register read, and all those different signals. So for this four-bit control signal, so if I have a four, I have four input for a select line, how, what's my mul multiplexer input to output ratio? 16, very good. Why is that? Two to the four. Yeah, two to the four. Yeah. So next over here, it's talking about this positive. Oh, let's go back. So this always at positive edge clock. So what that means is whenever the clock signal goes from zero to one, we want to do something. Otherwise, we're not going to do it during the clock signal. We're not going to do it at the negative edge clock. We want to very, very well from dealing with flip flops if you don't have any that kind of regulated uh, positive edge clock. You get a lot of it begins to just go back and forth a lot. So here at the positive clock, it's assigning the current value of the register to A, and it ends. And then whenever B or C or select begin, whenever Case one, select, if it's, uh, you want to put the bi uh, binary value of one onto B mod C. So the base, basically this is sending out the logic. So you have a, a, a set of cases here that tell you precisely what you want to put onto your different values uh, for your inputs. So cases select signal, so it's one, zero, one, one, zero, zero, you're gonna have a random value if it's one zero zero. So basically, you're coming up with some sort of logic that you want to have based on your B and uh, C inputs. And then once you come to the next clock, you just put that value that you put on A and A and the second always into your one bit output. So every clock signal, you should be getting some sort of output on A. So that's the general logic of this. So if you think of this Verilog, you think of it as you know you you you've Module, you always want to declare a foo. So you always want to declare a module, and then foo is just happens to be the name of the function. So whenever you call it in a higher level, the module hierarchy, you would just say foo, and you would put it in there. Uh, like so, you also have some, you know, behavioral logic. Remember, we were talking about that earlier. So you have the uh, division here. So now you're, uh, if you're actually thinking about it in terms of going down to the physical level you're reliant on the synthesis of the divider, so whatever dividing algorithm it's going to use. Also, you have to worry about the adder or subtractor. If you call from 385, you can have some basic adders or subtractors where you just put an XOR on the input, or you could have a carry select or carry look ahead adder where it's a lot faster, but it requires a lot more area. By de designing it in this way, you're dependent upon the synthesis tool to be able to do that for you. So in various... Um, design methodologies, you're going to worry, you want to check that. So there's a lot of design verification, functional verification. Do you have two circuits that do the same logic, but they have different con design constraints? Which one is better for your customer? So he's a Verilog training. So this course is free. Um, I actually gave the link here in the Word document. So you can go to, so there's an iVerilog simulator. You can actually test some Verilog code here. So this is actually the basic hello world. Right? So terminal output hello world. So the module has been ma called main and we 
you know, we have initialize and end the module. So begin and end is where our code is going to be done. So this dollar sign display is actually you're just writing that to the terminal. It's, a, it's very similar to uh, fprintf. And then finish is think about uh, if you want to have end and end module. These concepts are similar to return zero in C and C++, where you want to go back up to the zero in the program counter. And so this is when it's going to come up here. This is the this vol.verilog.com slash main. Uh, this is I believe this is where I send you for the. Um, yeah, that is precisely where I send you. Okay. Um, let me scroll back up here. So when it comes up in a second, how to take this course? That's the way. I just want you to click on the chapters. So chapter one, introduction, hierarchy, and modeling structures. So you go through this, and then there's a set of exercises at the end. So show me that you've done the exercises. So what I would want you to do is I hardware description language, and then you just click the arrow, read it over. This is a good little history. So parent modules and child modules. And then depicting the hierarchical relationships. If for those, Oh, no, none of you were in 385 last semester, right? In, well, you were the TA. So uh, I had the students in that course, I got some feedback from the teacher evaluations where I had them actually do the, you know, the, the .h hierarchy. And so when it comes up, you'll see that I have the, it says system comp one, comp two, and sub three. So a parent wants to instantiate the child module. So if you think about an adder, right, you have your AND gates and your XOR gates and your OR gates that you're using to implement that, right? So if you have one bit adder, you can then use 32 of those adders and hook them together to build a 32 bit adder and then use an adder and a set of multiplexers and OR gates and multiplier to put into an arithmetic logic unit. So your highest, your, your system would be an ALU and then you have a set of modules. They have an adder, which you have a two 32 bit inputs. You have your multiplier, you have all kinds of different things depending on how you want to design it. And that's, you know, your your goal is to depict the hierarchical relationship that way. And just like in C, if you have a circular relationship, meaning you have an ALU that calls an adder that somehow calls an ALU, for whatever reason, it'll, it won't run. So you doing things like that allow you to be able to properly design your circuit. Um, so my recommendation is before you write any code, lay out what you want to do and do it that way. So in the lecture notes, uh, let me go back to one point. That should be, there we go. All right, so 1.27, Verilog mo models are made up of modules, as we've discussed. Modules in terms are made of different types of components. So we've talked about nets parameters, registers, primitives, and instances. So if I wanted to, if I had a module in the, hier in the hierarchy, I wanted to call that foo, an instance of that foo is what we're talking about there. Continuous assignments, procedural blocks, procedural blocks is where we always have that always at positive edge clock, and then task function definitions. That's topical out objective 1.27. So the whole goal, um, I showed you that I'm going to show you that hello world again in a moment once everything kind of. Yeah, you can you can do well. You can do that. Um, that website that I included there, you can actually use that. If you're writing some barrel off code, if you're just, when, you're, when you go through your self test and you want to check to see if it actually works, but you can put the uh, barrel off code into that and, and test it in a run. And it's cheapest for it to get. Oh, of course. No, 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 no. no. What you're going to do is you're going to be doing uh, barrel log using cadence tools. And so basically what you're going to do is you're going to SSH secure uh, shell login. And then 
by itself as a server, you're going to take what you know about VHDL, write up a, a uh, description of a circuit you want to do, and you're actually going to go through the synthesis pro process. So you're going to learn Verilog using the uh, self-teaching. Te self I'm going to guide it and make sure that you guys are keeping up and uh, see if you have any questions. But the key thing is, then you're going to say, all right, so if I have a MIPS data path, I need to code this portion of... Uh, what, we, what I did last semester is I took a partial MIPS data path in Verilog, had people fill in portions of the control blocks, portions of the memory, portions of the ALU, and then, okay, now that it runs, test it, see if it actually works, then uh, go through the whole synthesis process. How does the chip layout? Tie it into the pathway. Test PBT, all the PBT corner. Then you take it to tape out. Then you actually have a design circuit. In this case, I might actually let you guys propose a smaller circuit that you would you can actually do the functionality and see if you can design your own chip that you want to make. So I'm in the process of finishing that up right now. But okay, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, no, you're not going to need the Xilinx IDE for this course. I don't think it works on Windows 10. Anymore. Yeah, it doesn't work on Windows 10. Yep. Thanks, Xilinx. Um, okay, so I wanted you guys to put in. Hello world. So we have the initial and end module. So every module you got to initialize it and you begin and end your code. So here are your dollar sign display, hello world, and then you're finished. So as we saw in that code uh, from before, this is actually All right, so when it comes up, you'll see what I uh, did there. Yeah. Oh. Um, on, on yeah, so I changed the little world, so this was actually 15 seconds ago. You get the general idea of the model, how it, how it works. So you initialize it, you end and end, and you have to that. Or you use a, a, an instance where you call foo, you add foo, and you can put a number of them in there, and the, the model hierarchy is going to have one call the other. And when you're able to do that, it'll work better. What's that? I think why is it better blog? Okay, well we'll we'll deal with that later. Let's stick to course material. Um, so the instantiation, uh, formally defined, contains a name, ports if necessary, and the, the implementation and end module. So if you see 128, I, I'm I'm changing them as we go. So 128. Uh, the module initialize begin and end. So if you have ports, like we looked at that foo example, so where our output port was A, and then we had the 32-bit input ports. That's what we're talking about there. The implementation, what's actually being done. So example, the reason why I said ports if necessary, we have an example of hello world where we didn't need any ports, right? It just automatically printed to the terminal. So just like what font does it? It does actually mean like I don't know. Like no, look at the code, right? So look at the hello world hello world code, right? So you didn't need any ports to execute that code, correct? When you mean ports, what ports are you like? The hardware? No, no, no. You, no, no. Gross conceptual error. The ports are just your in in out <laughs> inputs and outputs. Okay. Yeah. You remember what we were talking about before you asked about like why would you need <laughs> Eight for yeah, that's so you have so basically for any circuit block, you're having a set of inputs and a set of outputs, right? So now, before you get inside the block, you have to indicate how what the flow is and how it's actually working. So, TGO 1.30 is the definition of ports. Verilog modules have three types of ports inputs, output, and in out, meaning they can be bi directional. I highly recommend not using in out. If you find code that says in out, 
I recommend not using it because it'll have re it'll have real problems when you try tying it into other code that you've written. Um, especially if you're putting it onto a board that doesn't have bi-directional ports, it'll it'll compile, but then it will freak out when you actually try running it. And the whole goal of circuit design is to actually design a circuit that works. So. And so here we go, I have an example, and this will come up in a, in a second, uh, Demba. But I have the module foo, so I had uh, in one, in two, out one, out two, in BID one, right? So um, like, if we are- Hold on, let it, let it come up first before you ask your question. <laughs> no, so De Demba, I'm, I'm lecturing, please. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right, so in one and in two. So I initialized our, my ports, right? So, I'll come for a second. So when you see the actual module, I'll have I'm finding this foo. Okay, so it's starting to come up on some screen. So module foo, in one, in two, out one, out two, and by the PID. So the first thing I did was I actually defined that whether there are any inputs or outputs, right? So input one, input two, output, out one, out two, and in out PID one, right? And so then I say end module. So the second part, and this is now answering your question, Gemma, where I have this other uh, module here. It says module top level. So it does not require ports. So the top level, I'm just initializing everything there. So I don't have anything going into the highest level because that's where I want everything starting. So you're not going to have anything coming into the computer chip that is actually the computer chip itself. Uh, so at the module top level, I have uh, a number of wire sources in sync, as well as bus. And I've defined an instance of module foo, F0, within the top level. Now here's the way this has been done. And so I'm going to highlight F0 here. Uh, and it'll take 15 seconds to come up. But uh, let, me, let me say this and then I'll get the question. So, so instantiate the module in the module, you notice that it's foo and F0 and then it's hybrid over. So that's source, source, sync, sync, and bus. Okay? So bus is kind of the initializing kind of the bi direction of the wire. And then by sources and syncs, eventually you're going to you know, uh, test that and you're actually putting the inputs into those values. Now I'm going to Foo, I'm saying that this is a instance of foo, and this is a unique instance of foo at zero. So I can define another one if I wanted to do. Uh, I, I can, if I want to do it in the next one here, this will come up. So I would do foo f1, and I could add, you know, uh, source three and source four, and I could do source three, source four, sync three, sync four, and then bus. And so now I've created two instances within the higher module of food. Okay. Now, if I wanted to do So what's going to happen, you will, at some point when you are coding in Verilog, you will get you know, a, a huge set of error messages and you'll wonder what the hell you just did. You will have probably made a mistake like this. It'll come up in a few seconds where it's F, you've instantialized the same instance, F0, twice. So we, we, you'll see when it uh, comes up where I deleted F1 and called it F0. This is just, an, this is an error. So you go and change it back to F1, you'll be fine. Okay, so combining concepts. Uh, basically, you're not allowed to have missing ports in Verilog. Hey, George, what was your question? Oh, I was going to ask you what you did for that. You might have a question there. Okay. On that one, EF buzz, EF on a wire bus, and then for F0 and F1, you also have. Yeah, you're, you, can, you're, can, you would be tying, it's because it's a bi directional port. So the way it would actually, if this theoretical circuit, right? So I'd have foo, right? And then I'd have uh, some sort of bus here going in. And then it can also, I have a second one where I'd have the same, you know, bus going to the other one. 
So you just have it would just have a fan out there. So it would be the same thing if I had uh, instances of uh, adders where for some reason I put in this A into both adder, but then I had B1 and B2 go into the other inputs for the adder. So it would just create a fan out. That's a good question though, because it ties into like how does the synthesis underlying synthesis work? Okay, parameter is just uh, this one line, a constant value declared. That should be 1.31, by the way. Uh, a constant value declared within the module structure. So what that means is you can set a, uh, a parameter, like, for example, we were talking about bus widths earlier, right? So I can say in width 32. And you think of it as a global variable. So if you're trying to... Think about whether or not I like a 32-bit bus or a 64-bit bus. Instead of having to go to every line and decode the length of the width of the bus, you can just say width parameter width is 32, and then you can just use the term width throughout the rest of your uh, B that comes through here. So in this example, uh, you see output width minus one to zero. That just means 31 down to zero. 31 down to zero. Uh, for it. and then you have the same thing here. You could actually say input 31 for shift count. So let's say I wanted to change it from 32 to 16 for some reason. Instead of having to go down and change all of them from 31 to 15 all over the place, it just will automatically do it. So that's why understanding a perimeter is useful. So as part of your uh, weekend assignment, um, here's that link that I, you can go to this link, the vol.verilog.com slash vol slash main.htm, and that's where I sent you here. And that is um, where you can go to do it without having, because at the initial uh, link, you had to do this registering. If you go through that, you don't have to register at all. So that'll save you some trouble. So I want you to do chapter one and chapter two this weekend. So go through, I mean, this answers the, your port list. You know, so basically, it's. I, I know the the uh, this makes it look like it's going to be long. By promise, continuous assignments. It's actually really short. So here, this example of continuous assignments, where I was talking about earlier, you have outputs assigned B zero through B three input in one and in two, and then assign. And so this is your continuous assignment. And you'll see when it comes up, assign B0 is equal to not in one and not in zero. B1 is not in one and in zero. So basically, it's just creating a truth table for a decode for a decoder. But yeah, when you go through this, you'll go through the whole thing. And then when you get to the end of chapter one, there's these exercises, right? So just do the, the exercises. You can do even do control print screen or control shift three um, and just put them in a Word document to demonstrate that you've actually done them. Right. Yes. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I'll, I sorry, I'll, I, the, my, didn't process it first. Yeah. Um, I should say that in the uh, document here, uh, if you, you <laughs> Do a screen capture. Uh, you can email them to me. Uh, some people feel more comfortable printing them out, uh, so that I guess that's why I said yes. But you, you may email that to me before lecture, and I, I can then check it and put it in the, on the library. But there you see how we did the first uh, question here, where it just says which of the so I selected modules, which of the following Verilog structures may occur outside of other structures. So ports, you need the port for each of a structure and the parameters and the instances within the structure. But the module, you don't need ports or modules to do it. So that's why that's correct. So just say you selected the correct one, that you have that, and then you want to put that in your, to your guide as well. So that way you can kind of review those. So And then it's just 10 questions. So All right. So... It's pretty straightforward. It shouldn't take you that terribly long. So I, undergrads do one and two. Grad students uh, do chapters one through three. Um, and I have a, an example here of a DAN gate in analog. 
uh, as NAND2, so it's a two input NAND gate. And so module A, B, and Ys, and for those of you who've had me before, you know I'm very picky about commenting code, which is a good habit. Um, preconditions are A and B, and postconditions are Y, meaning that preconditions are your inputs and postconditions are your outputs. Um, so I've called the module NAND underscore gate two, indicates it's the two input NAND gate. And so A, B, and Y are my ports. I define A and B as inputs and Y as an output. And now here's the cool thing about Verilog that's different than VHDO and why we're studying in this particular course. You can define your supply voltages here. So in this case, it's, and it's actually VDD and ground are reserved keywords in Verilog. So supply one, like VDD, and supply zero is ground. So I am assigning supply one, that's actual supply voltage, to the VDD. And you can see later on in the NMOS and PMOS transistors, I actually am putting in uh, the VDD and ground values. And then a wire net between them. So that also has keywords of NMOS and PMOS. So if there's that is a... Uh, module within Verilog itself. So uh, you don't have to code the NMOS module. It does it, it already has it in there. So the NMOS transistor, it has it, as we all, as we know, a NAND gate has four transistors. Here it has N we've called N0 and N1. So we say Y is the output. So here drain source and gain and, and gate is drain source and gate from left to right as defined in Verilog. So here we have NMOS zero ties into the output. So we would call the output Y. And for those of you on lag in 15 seconds, you'll see what I'm doing here. So A is this input here. So that's our gate. So that's going to be the last one. And then we have net two. That's what I call it. And that net two is what's in between the source for N zero and I define it as the drain for N1. So this is N0 here. And so this is N1. So that's ground. And so I tie that to B. So you see how that is tying in, how, how we're translating the actual code to the physical layout here. And so now for the PMOS transistors, they both tie into Y. So the PMOS here, the drain is Y. The source is VDD, and the gate is B, and that ties to P0. So that's that specific instance of P0 in the Verilog. And then V1, I should draw it properly. And that is transistor P1, and that ties to A, and that ties to VDD. Okay, sorry to come up at everybody's screen. So you see how it actually the drawings of the PMOS uh, circuit actually tie into the Verilog code. Where's the actual specific entity? You can see that here and here with this one. You can see that the drain is Y, so that's the first one on the left, and then the source is the middle one. So it's going to have net two, which you can find as a wire in the Verilog codes. So basically, a wire you're just using it to connect for one process to another model. And then the uh, gate is the one on the right in this case. So you notice how the gates are all tied in inputs. And then on the drawing that I've done here, you can see that I've actually uh, shown you which transistor is tied in which one, so you can see how the code acts. So you can you can do this in VHDL. VHDL tends to stay above the uh, physical model and stays at the behavioral and structural level. <laughs> so what becomes very useful when you be able to do this with cadence is you can take a Verilog and export it to something called Spice. Now Spice is another way of rep represent transistors, and you're actually tying it into a physical model. So what we mean by a physical model, 
is how do you actually represent your 22 nanometer transistor, how do you represent your 23 micron transistor. So the technology file will be tying with that, you're actually going to be sizing the transistors to work appropriately. And so your synthesis tool will help you work with doing that. And so it tells you precisely where to do the layout. So Spice is actually going to be a very useful tool for you. All right, so the second module I have in here is actually how do you simulate it? So I have NAND gate module where I call the NMOS and PMOS modules, and then I call this NAND2 underscore stimulate, where preconditions are none and postconditions are A and B. So the whole goal is I'm trying to generate A and B inputs for this circuit. So I define output A and B. The parameter delay, I just call it 100, so it's going to be every 100 nanoseconds, you're going to get a change on the input. So what I'm doing here is I'm having it count. So register 0 and 1 is here. So it's creating an in, a two-input test. So for NAND gate, you want to do 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And so you're going to count from 0 to 4. I, I, I'm 0 to 3, excuse me. It's, not, it's IE. For I equals 0, I is less than 4, I plus plus. So 0, 1, 2, and 3. So our whole goal is to take the digital values and correlate them to binary values. Okay. And so you're incrementing count. And so that assigned value here, which you'll see in a second, actually generates that. So what you can do is you could say if you have three inputs, you can represent all eight inputs by having it count from zero to seven and then having three outputs, output A, B, and C, and then assign A, comma, B, comma, C equals count. So the next one I have is called NAND underscore two driver. And so I generate, see how I do not, well, poor Demba, he's not here. We now have a good example of how when you don't need ports in a module. So you don't have any ports here, but you've generated three wires, A, B, and Y. So you have your inputs and outputs. And so this module, this NAND underscore uh, stem, I've called the specific invention stem, and I have two outputs. So it's generating using this assigned values, whether it's a zero or a one, to say that's actually gener stimulating the NAND gate. And then I've created NAND underscore gate N0, so I've created an instance. So this A and this B are driving it, and then I have my output. Right? And so, the last thing you'll see is this dollar sign monitor. This actually allows you to test the values of the circuit when you're actually running it. And they'll tell you what the outputs are and print them to the screen. So what I can do is I can actually take this code that I have written here and copy it all, right? And I can go back to that. Uh, First, let me go back to that. Not this link here, iverilog.com slash index.php. And we can go to this link here. And so this is where you can actually go and compile Verilog code, right? So now I can actually go to this code that I presented to you in class. And it has the same commenting structure as C and C++ in terms of how do you comment things out. So I can put that in there, like I just did, and then run the code. And then once you go past the weird uh, advertising, what's actually happening is it starts at zero, zero, 
and it does the terminal output. So you can see this monitor is actually printing to the display the values of what it should be. So I've printed out in the monitor, first I have the time. So I remember in, in my driver, I had a delay for 100 nanoseconds. So after 100 nanoseconds, it's not going to go to zero one. And that's going to go to 100, 200, 300, right? So I can actually say what the value is at the specific times, and it's monitoring it. So you can actually, so by using this module hierarchy, what we're actually done is we started out, we designed our NAND gate using NMOS and PMOS transistors, and then we stimulate it every 100 nanoseconds. So let's say I change this to 50, right? And I just run, the, and I ran the code again. It's just gonna be half. So I'm now gener I'm using that stimulation module to generate the inputs for the circuit, and then by using that those assigned values, and then my NAND2 driver, I'm actually creating wires for A and B, right? And then Y for the output, and I'm putting those wires into the NAND gate, A and B, and I'm using stimulate to actually give me the two the zero 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 one one zero and one one for the inputs. And then I'm getting an output. And by using this an initial begin and end here, so I put this, I put the circuits together and then doing the initial begin and end, every time the value changes, it prints the screen. So we've done, we've now designed a NAND gate. You've done it in the stick diagram level. You've done the path diagram. And now that you know how to do that, now you can use Verilog to actually code it up and actually test it that it works. And so we can see at the terminal output when we have, it's always going to be a Y equals one on the output, except when we have A equals one and B equals one. So we've proven that our device that we've designed works properly. So does anybody have any questions? I'll happily go over the Verilog again for you guys. Why is it going back to zero zero? Is that part of the oh, because, oh, yes, the, that's a good question. So it's looping, right? So let's go back to NAND underscore stimulate. So once it goes back here, it's going from zero to three. I equals zero to I equals three. So it's incrementing every time, right? And so we actually go to the next uh increment parameter delay. So once it repeats, it's actually this, this one line. Okay, there's the line right there. You'll see repeat begin. It should come up in a second. It says repeat and in parentheses is four and then it says begin. So once it starts again, it's going to do it four times. So it's going to increment four times and then it goes back, it should go back to zero to zero. Any other questions about this? Everyone's just enjoying being up at nine in the morning. So what is the red one 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 colon zero happening? Where what well, I'm sorry, what? Oh register. Oh oh yeah, because you need to actually have two values, right? So you So that is creating just the Yeah, it's creating it's creating two values within the Verilog code, and you're using that to actually assign that. To, it's two, two register values to hold the value because you have to have it zero zero. Wires don't have memory. This is a really good question. Hey guys, pay attention. So George's question is about this register. I have bits one to zero CNT, and so when you want you want to change every 50 nanoseconds according to the code I wrote, correct? Wires are not memory elements. They just pass signals. It's, but you need to have something to hold the current value that you're trying to test. So you're actually putting, you're signing two registers, two register bits to hold the value that you're trying to count up and down to. So if you want four bits, you have to add four registers. Correct. You'd have to change that to three, three to zero. So that that notation means three down to zero. If for those of you who've done VHDL. Okay. 
Any other Verilog questions? So, so there I have an example of a, let me just go to the MIPS processor part. So if your code's like messed up, it'll like... It won't, it'll, you it'll show you that, it'll give you an error message. Okay. Yeah. Is it, is it it depends. It depends on the compiler. It really depends on the compiler. That compiler compiler theory is a whole career. It was the single toughest course I took as a grad student, um, which we don't need to worry about right now. Let's just talk about. Let's finish up this talk about the kind of I'll give a brief overview of how this MIPS processor works and how it's going to tie into the course. So. Um, we're going to talk about kind of a reduced 8-bit data version of the uh, MIPS data path. Uh, you've gotten through 385, you really understand architecture. Um, so this table that I have here, table 1.7 in the textbook, uh, just has a reduced set of instructions. So basically, uh, the way, for those of you who haven't dealt with MIPS before, the way the language works is it adds the two on the right and puts it into the register stored on the left. Same thing with subtraction, anding and oring, set less than, add immediate. Does anybody remember what immediate instructions do? Both the 385 and microprocessor, you should know. Well, of what? <laughs> We have, well, that's that's what we had to do, but why? What specifically oh, is it? Is that yes, there we go. So the immediate value, remember, you if you're adding two registers and putting a third register, you should use and, but add i adds a value from register and a number that happens to be in the instruction and puts it into another register. So that's the immediate value. So branch equivalent, branches when you're, like, if statements, uh, you're comparing two values and doing the result. Uh, jump, you're at a specific, uh, uh, value of the program counter and jump it to another one. And then here in uh, MIPS, it was load word and store word because a word is 32 bits. And in this instance, it's an 8 bit data path that's load byte and store byte. So you're just taking the, you, this is your base address, you have your offset, which is this immediate value, you add them together, you get the value from data memory and store it to a local register or store byte. You take the value from the register and store it into the data memory. Yes, and in the re in the local registers. So this is just basically loading from data a the non volatile data memory to the volatile local registers that's in the da in the data path. So this is these are the fast registers, and then the only in MIPS. Uh, you only want to get stuff from data memory using load and store operations. Uh, so all of these are local register copies. Yeah. And so here, this is the, it still uses a 32-bit instruction, uh, and it has five bits to indicate specific registers. So RD is register destination. Uh, so you have your uh, two registers that you're adding here. And then for I type, if you're, you'd be adding this, the value in this register plus the immediate value, which is the 16 bits in this case, and then stores it in RB. And jump destination just takes this 26 bit value, uh, shifts left by two, and then stores it in that value for the result. So um, what we're going to be doing, we're not going to be going into, you know, tell me what the five stages of the data path are, or that kind of stuff. Um, but what we're going to be doing is you're going to be taking, uh, you're going to be understanding how the finite state machine works and being able to take C code. So this is some basic C code of a Fibonacci solver, right? And so what are you just starting? We want to com uh, compute eight Fibonacci numbers and then just add them up. And so how do you actually implement this using the MIPS data path? Well, we're going to uh, compile it down to the uh, assembly language, which if you took 385 with me, I, I'm going to just kind of basically go over this is what happens. This is the relationship to logical and physical. So you're adding immediate 
So the first stage, we're actually adding one and negative one. And then this while loop is basically just the loop we represent here. So we want to jump back to loop, which basically is represented as a number in the actual instruction. And so the machine language actually takes that down to over to the signal language to the actual physical implementation of being done in one computer. Okay. You have your control signals, your register values, and uh, your immediate values, and those are some high and sequential controls. So that was another question that had. Um, that you don't want to use these control signals to control the flow through the data path. Um, you all probably recognize something similar to this. What's going to go on here in a second? The multi. This is a multi-cycle architecture, uh, which is a little different than the single-cycle of a pipeline architecture that you learn. But the whole the concepts are the same. Where you have control signals uh, controlling the flow through the data path. You have a program counter, uh, instruction and data memory, register files, and arithmetic logic units. Uh, in this particular diagram, the multiplexers are represented uh, much larger than normal. Um, they shift left to and as usual. So now the multi-cycle data path, and this is what your Verilog code is going to really tie into. Let me look over this. I think this is the end of section one. But this, no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Um, but basically, for each, you know, you have a it's trying to optimize the flow through the data path so it's actually using a finite state machine saying to say and it when you remember that con, that TGO where I had the controls there's a bunch of NAND gates and it represented the zeros and ones through the inputs for those of you who had me through 385 this actually uses registers uh, it's much more complex uh, and you will code parts certain parts of it you, I'll give you like this is a partial solution do these Fill these parts in, but, but you'll, you know, if you can figure out using the registers, especially once you go through this, like if I did uh, state nine, which is ALU source A is equal to one, ALU source B is equal to zero, zero, ALU op is equal to one, zero, that four bit, you know, that you, it's close to 16. So you would need a four bit control signal. So if it's that you're always at positive edge clock, always at controller one, zero, zero one that's nine and then you would just code that in there it's pretty straightforward and then uh let's skip over that so that just mm. okay so here's the last thing i want to show you before i dismiss you it will come up here it says mips floor plan and this will be the end of section one so how do you use my physical details and then find the so you're actually going to have a data path and you have a control right and it's actually going to be laid out in a certain number of lambda. So remember these lambda design models. And this goes and shows up. Yeah, I scroll past that and it gets to Okay, so this diagram here. So on the outside, right, I show, I've shown you a picture of a pad frame. That's where you would have, it has 40 pads, and the width and length of, of this is 500 lambda. And so the controller of the uh, multi-cycle data path is actually 2,550 lambda by 380 lambda, and the data path is actually 2,550 lambda by 1,320 lambda. And so you have, since it has eight bit slices because it's an eight bit data path, and we'll go into this in a lot more detail. But so you can actually see how you're actually gonna synthesize this out. And so you actually go through the different stages and learn how to actually use that. And then you'll actually be able to see how it physically lays out in your design how to make it work so on that note uh, I've kept you over time so it is time to dismiss you